Let me invite you now to um, open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, and this time Jeremiah chapter 23. Now, I originally planned to, uh, for us to study the whole chapter, all 40 verses. But then I decided to uh, divide that chapter into two. And the first division, which uh, actually includes the first eight verses, that's what we will study tonight. And then the second division, from verses 9 through 40, that's what we will study next time. So for tonight, um, I'd like for us to uh, turn our Bibles to Jeremiah 23. Let me read verses 1 through 8. Okay, so in, in our Bible study, it's always helpful to have an open Bible in front of you, okay? So open your Bible and turn with me to Jeremiah 23. Let me read verses 1 through 8. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. Verse 4, I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Verse 6, in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, that they will live in their own land. I divided this short section, eight verses, into three. The first is, I'd like us to look at the pronounced judgment by the Lord on the shepherds, verses one and two. The second, we look at the promised deliverance and or restoration of the remnant of God's flock. That's verses three and four. And then the third part, we look at the prophesied righteous branch, verses five through verse eight. Let's look at the first two verses. The Lord pronounced judgment on the shepherds. Who are the shepherds mentioned in verse one? Both the New English Translation and the New Living Translation use the phrase, the leaders of my, meaning God's, people. Okay? They skip the word shepherds. Instead, use the words, the leaders of God's people. These shepherds were leaders, okay? Expected by God to tend Okay, twice that word is mentioned, verse 2 and then again in verse 4. To tend means to feed, to pasture, to guide, to teach, to rule. Okay, so to tend God's people. Well, the word shepherds could also refer to prophets and priests. In fact, prophets and priests were mentioned later in this chapter particularly verse 11, and then we will encounter them 
in verses 33 and 34 when we study this chapter next time. But looking at the first two verses and then considering the context, okay, the mention of um, David, the mention of a king that God promised to send, the shepherds would directly refer to the kings of the house of David, the kings of the house of Judah, okay? Expected by God to lead, to tend, to guide, to feed, to pasture, to shepherd the people of Judah, God's people. First one, the first word there is woe. Woe is used here as an introductory particle in God's judgment that's pronounced upon the leaders, the shepherds, the leaders of God's people. The New Living Translation, instead of using the word woe, used this phrase, what sorrow awaits. The New English Translation has sure to be judged. The word woe introduced a harsh judgment, an indictment to be precise. First, there was the charge, and then there's God's judgment on the leaders of his people. And why did God pronounce judgment on the shepherds or leaders of his people? Verse 1, the New Living Tr Translation rendering, For they have destroyed and scattered the very ones they were expected to care for, says the Lord. You know, the Hebrew word translated destroy could also be translated to blot out, to kill, to exterminate, to give up. In Ezekiel chapter 34, okay, Ezekiel talks about the shepherds, referring particularly to the kings. And in verse 4, God tells the shepherds how they destroyed his flock with these words. Verse 4, Ezekiel 34. You have not taken care of the weak. You have not tended the sick or bound up the injured. You have not gone looking for those who have wandered and are lost. Instead, you have ruled them with harshness and cruelty. NIV 2011 drop cruelty and use the word brutality. Be careful that we don't treat God's people with harshness and brutality. The word scattering is again a, a strong charge word used here by God. For we, we all know through our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament that it's not good for sheep to scatter because when they scatter, they become vulnerable to predators, wild animals. Listen to what Ezekiel says in verse 5 of Ezekiel 34. So they, God's flock, God's sheep, were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, what happened? They became food for all the wild animals. Who are today's shepherds serving or tending God's flock or his people? You know, it's always tempting to use this and then apply this to today's uh, rulers, kings, uh, presidents, prime ministers. <laughs> Before you, you do that, to properly apply this lesson, this message, it has to be to leaders who will lead God's people. Today's leaders of God, today's shepherds, they're the ones God called, appointed to lead his people, his church, not just the pastors, but also the elders. In Acts 20, verse 28, elders were supposed to shepherd. Peter himself, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, appealed to his fellow elders to shepherd 
God's flock. Not only the pastors and elders, but I believe everyone called by God to lead, guide, teach his people, his flock, his sheep. And this, I believe, include the deacons, the committee or ministry heads, the grow group leaders, the Bible study leaders, the leaders of gems, cadets, even the parents who are called by God to shepherd, nurture their families in the truth of the Lord. These are all in God's eyes, His shepherds, to lead, feed, guide, teach, rule over His people for the glory of His name. And all these shepherds are expected by the Lord to depend on Him. After all, in John, Jesus introduced Himself as the Good Shepherd. And when the leaders of the church depend on God, they are able to shepherd the people of God according to how God wants them to shepherd His people. Or in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 78, verse 32, describing King David's faithful shepherding of his people, David shepherded, cared for the people of God with integrity of heart and skillful hands. Another translation, with true heart and skillful. Another word that can be used there is wise, intelligent, discerning hands. So leaders in God's church, are we shepherding, leading, caring for the people of God with true heart and wise, skillful hands, referring to our actions? Are we setting good examples for the sheep? The king of Judah, the kings of Judah whom God expected to tend his people, failed miserably to do their job as God's flock was destroyed and scattered. And so God declares in verse 2, I will destroy them as well. I will bestow punishment on them for the evil they have done. So God will judge them. God will punish them. Let's look at the second one. The Lord promised deliverance for the remnant of his flock. Verses 3 and 4. Since God would punish the evil shepherds for destroying and scattering his flock, question is, what would then happen to God's sheep who are scattered or in dire need of a faithful, good, responsible shepherd? Look at verse 3. And here, when the shepherds fail to shepherd God as he has called them to, God himself will shepherd his people. And look at God's promises in verses 3 to 4. The Lord himself will shepherd his people by one. God said, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them. You know, the opposite, opposite of, of scatter is to gather. Okay? So God himself will gather his people. People who are lost, who are spiritually sick, weak, vulnerable. People who felt they failed God and failed other people. God will gather them. And what else will God do? He will bring them back. I will bring them back to their pasture, to their land back to his presence where they will be what fruitful and increase in number look at verse 4 another promise from god the lord himself will place shepherds over them who will tend them care for them love them guide them and they will no longer be afraid nor will any be missing declares the lord here we see God's justice and love 
in full display once again. God's justice is shown when His people disobeyed Him and He drove them away. Verse 3. Julius, I thought the evil shepherds drove away God's people. How come here in verse 3, God is saying He's the one who actually, um, He's the one who's driven them away. Well, they're both, okay? So the evil shepherds, okay, they drove away, okay? They destroyed God's people. But God used that also to punish His disobedient people. And then we see God's love in full display as well in His promise to gather His sheep, the remnant of His people, to bring them back to the promised land and to place, set up leaders, good leaders, good shepherds, who will care for them so that they will not be afraid when they're in the land they will flourish and as god faithfully does what is just and loving towards sinful people should we as church leaders do anything less we should also be faithful in caring for people even when the people in God's church would not listen to us, would reject us, would ridicule us, and refuse to listen to God's word. Another application here is, you know, for leaders who have failed, or leaders who are growing weary and overwhelmed, and feeling like giving up on leading God's people in their hearts they know that God has called them but then circumstances there's so many things that happen and their heart has been broken they're discouraged the fact that God shepherds his own people I think we should all take courage take comfort in this particular truth God shepherds God loves his sheep and will always love them and care for them even the shepherd leaders in his flock so if you are a shepherd leader in God's church and you feel so discouraged you felt like you have given so much, you have been faithful in serving God, and yet you failed miserably. People are angry at you. Turn to God. Okay? And rejoice, benefit in His love. Your God, the Good Shepherd. If you're a member of the church and you have been hurt, offended, particularly by so-called leaders in the church, I encourage you, turn to God. Your Good Shepherd. And rejoice in His love. Because He will care for you. He will heal you. He will minister to you. The truth is that God's shepherd leaders in His church are not perfect. That's the bad news. That's why leaders should be dependent always on the perfect God. But the good news is we serve a perfect God the perfect God who loves us so much and will continue to show his love to his people to his sheep leaders or followers 
church leaders or church members alike, God will shower you with his love. The third and last, let's look at the Lord who promised righteous, a righteous branch to come. It's God's love that compels him to reiterate his promise to send the royal righteous branch. Look at verse 5, the first part. I, the Lord, promise that a new time will certainly come when I will raise up for them a righteous branch, a descendant of David. And what will this righteous branch actually do? The second part. A king who will reign wisely. So he will govern, he will rule with wisdom and do what is just and right in the land. Remember in our previous study of uh, Jeremiah where God, you know, um, reminded the kings to administer justice, to do what is just, to do what is right. This particular righteous branch, the Messiah, will come and he will do what is just and what is right. Another prophet named Isaiah writes about this branch in Isaiah chapter 11. Let me read the New Living Translation rendering. Verse 1 of Isaiah 11. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. Verse 4. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his voice. Jeremiah 23 verse 6 tells us also that this righteous branch will bring what? Salvation to Judah. Reference to God's people and safety to Israel. Another reference to God's people. And the rest of verse 6 we read, this is the name by which he will be called. In other words, it's not actually the name that you will call him by, but the name that characterizes him. This righteous branch and his rule, his way. The Lord, our righteousness. Or in NIV 2011, the Lord, our righteous Savior. King Zedekiah's name means... The Lord is my righteousness. Yep. God's using a pun, a play, a word here. Zedekiah's name. Zedekiah means the Lord is my righteousness. And the Messiah, the righteous branch that God will send, he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. King Zedekiah failed miserably to live up to his name. He did not do justice and righteousness. But the promised Messiah, the promised righteous branch, righteous Savior from the line of David, and we know fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, will come as the good, perfect King Shepherd of God's people and will bring salvation and safety to God's people. Those who will believe in God through Jesus Christ, the righteous Savior, He is the one who will make everyone who believes right before the eyes of God. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, the righteous branch, the righteous Savior, so that everyone who believes in Him 
and this righteous Savior will not perish. Perish? Remember those two words? Be destroyed and scattered. Okay? Destroyed, scattered. They will not be destroyed nor be scattered, but they will have eternal life. And what's one indication that people who receive God's amazing love and grace through Jesus Christ, the, the, the righteous Savior, okay? what, would, what would we see them doing? These people who have experienced God's love, God's grace through Jesus. Look at verses 7 and 8. Here we see Jeremiah's description of the people who have been, who have experienced um, God's deliverance. Okay? Verse 7. Let me read that again for you. So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will do will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, but they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel out of the land of the north, referring to the deliverance from Babylonian exile. So in other words, people will not be talking anymore of the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. They will be talking all the more about God's deliverance from Babylonian exile. And sure enough, you know, the Babylonian exile, I think it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's much richer in terms of, you know, its context. The people actually rebelled. They deserved nothing but destruction from God. But then God saved them, gathered them, brought them back to the land. And he placed good shepherds, leaders, to serve them, feed them, care for them. But I think, I think, the deliverance and restoration by the righteous Savior should also be seen in these two verses. The deliverance or salvation through Jesus Christ the righteous Savior overshadows all experiences of deliverance. I believe in my heart that every true born again believer should always appreciate, always celebrate, rejoice, or talk about their salvation, their experience of deliverance through Jesus Christ. We rejoice and celebrate such deliverance when we worship, when we serve, when we live for the Lord Jesus. We celebrate it when we talk about it with people, the deliverance we receive, we experience from God. We celebrate when we talk with people in church and those outside of the church. When was the last time you talk about such deliverance that you receive? that you experience from God? When was the last time we shared our story of God's deliverance in our lives? Are we eager to share the good news about Jesus to people around us? So that they too, they too, will be saved and experience the salvation that Jesus Christ lovingly offers. Today we celebrate Valentine's Day. And what for? <laughs> I guess we celebrate love. We celebrate Martin Luther King Day to commemorate the life and huge contribution of MLK. We celebrate Independence Day. I don't know, fire, some fireworks here and there. We celebrate Labor Day. Let's learn to really celebrate. Our salvation, our deliverance. When God extended to us His love, His love we don't deserve, through His Son, who gave His life for us. 
and rose from the dead, certifying, confirming, especially before God, the finished work, salvation, deliverance from all sins for everyone who believes. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for your assurance that those of us who believe in your righteous Savior, you have made right and reconciled with you. Thank you for your gift of leaders in your church and in your household. Help those who lead. Lord, encourage them. Teach them and enable them to tend your people for the glory of your name. Help your people who are being led to care for the leaders you have gifted them with, also for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.